Are you ready? See you red. It's time for another episode of Fireside Chat. We're back for another episode of Fireside Chat, and this one is right in the middle of the Flames' Dad's Week. I'm Dan, and and always I'm joined by Matt. How you doing, buddy? Good. So, Matt, last week we we underestimated this team. We both thought they were going to come away with two of the possible six points on the table. And we were right that the Flames ended up losing to the Penguins, but neither of us thought they would beat the Sharks twice in a week. No, and uh, historically the Flames have somewhat struggled against San Jose, so it's surprising that we were able to sweep them in San Jose. I think we went, what, 4-1 and one on the series this year? Yeah, it's actually the first time since 95-96 that the Flames won three times in San Jose. Wow. It's pretty impressive. Yeah, the the first time was uh, here in the dome. We won uh, three to one, and then we won four to one in Anaheim, or sorry, in San Jose, uh, just yesterday on Monday, and that was quite a good game. Um, I thought the Flames played one of the best first periods I've seen in a while from them. Yeah, I thought that actually both the games against the San Jose Sharks were probably two of the best games over the full 60 minutes that the Flames have played all season. Yeah, you're probably right. It seems like, as I'm thinking back to the other San Jose games, it seems like the San Jose Sharks in general have brought out the best in the Flames this year. Mm -hmm. It's actually somewhat surprising how much San Jose has fallen lately. Like, Even though they're still a playoff team, like I'm not concerned when we play them anymore you know i think part of that is i mean san jose was a powerhouse for years and they could never get things done in the playoffs and really there wasn't a lot of movement in their core and now we're starting to see that that core is getting older but i don't think that they have necessarily the young players or at least enough young players maybe to fill that core so i think we're going to start to see san jose go through a rebuild in the next five years Oh, yeah, and especially, like, once they move Thornton and Marlowe, like, there's not really too much beyond those guys, especially in the young players. Like, Hurdle and Yeto are nice players, but they're not even remotely close to on the par with guys like Monaghan and Gaudreau and that that you need to have as your nucleus. Yeah, and they've had a lot of good players come through that organization in the past five, six years. Like I'm just thinking of guys I know who have come through there, and it seems like every time there's a a hot young player, they seem to trade them away. Mm -hmm. I know. The first name that uh, comes to mind is Charlie Coyle for Minnesota, and like he's doing really well for the Wild lately. Yeah, and I mean, looking down that roster, even guys, you know, who are like Tyler Kennedy, who's 28, um, you know, James Shepard, who's 26, they've got some decent pieces who are a little bit older. But yeah, I don't think that they've got, even looking through their system here, they don't have a lot of, as you mentioned, top flight um, young players. And I don't think they have enough stuff to trade for top flight young players either. So it's going to be interesting to see what that what that team ends up doing. Yeah, it somewhat reminds me of how Calgary was before we actually lit the dynamite and blew it up. Yeah, and that's a good point too. I mean, if they let um if they let their two stars retire as sharks, if, you know, Marlo and um uh, and Thornton end up retiring as sharks, I think that they're probably going to lose out on what Calgary had where they were able to get assets and start that rebuild. And I really think they're going to have to deal those guys in order to move forward. I agree. Um, when when I think back to this last week, especially this last game against the Sharks, I think as we have in the past, we have to really give Lance Booma some credit. He played fantastic in yesterday's game, and I think we're really starting to see an emergence of a new Lance Booma this year. Mm-hmm. And Kelly Rudy last night said that that was probably the best game that Booma's played in his entire career. And... To be honest, he's actually been playing almost at that level for a solid month and a half now. He has, yeah. Ever since he got promoted up the roster and he started playing with Monaghan, um, it seems like that's brought out the best in him. Mm-hmm. And he's already up to, what, 22 or 23 points, which 
He currently sits at 22 that's... points. Nine goals, 13 yeah. assists, 22 points. Yeah, and for somebody that's basically been looked at as a fourth line guy, that's actually an excellent season. Even for a third line guy, that's a fairly decent season. Yeah, it is. And only 30 penalty minutes. So, I mean, he's not getting himself into a lot of penalty trouble like we've seen from some of our fourth line guys, especially our more, you know, bruiser guys in past seasons, which is good. Mm hmm. Yeah, he's not being reckless. Like, even when he hits people, it's clean hits, not, you know, like hitting them from behind into the boards or anything like that. Yeah, he's averaging roughly half a penalty minute per game. Yeah, and even last night, like, he was being physical, but he was also blocking shots, got a goal and an assist. Like, he was basically doing everything. Yeah, that game against San Jose, he seemed like he, I don't know what, what happened. Maybe it's with his dad there because they're on the dad's trip, but it just seemed like he had to do everything. Like, we saw him go out and, I think, play the most complete game I've ever seen from him, as Kelly Rudy said. Mm-hmm. But yeah, the, the promotion up the lineup definitely helped him out. And I think that if they hadn't have promoted him up there, we never would have seen what we've seen from him now and really know what we have there. Yeah, and it's one of those things that you don't know if he's going to continue through the rest of the season playing this well or if it's just a hot streak. But at least he's showing that there is possibly something more there than what was previously thought. Well, even outside of, you know, this season is can he continue this next season, the season after, or is it just one year of a hot streak? And more so than if he can repeat it this season, that'll be my curiosity is, you know, is this a flash in the pan? Is he just doing well and so is everyone else all at the same time? Or is there actually a, a an evolution of his game? Something to look forward to seeing. For sure. And, you know, as we've said in the past, it's great to have those third, fourth line guys who can do that and guys that can stay here for a while and, you know, are going to be those spark plugs on the team. If I were true living, I'd be trying to lock this guy up long term as fast as possible. Yeah. Bulma's the type of player that you win Stanley Cups with. Yeah, I think he's he's the kind of guy that you see as the new franchise players in the NHL. You're not seeing the stars stick around with the same franchise anymore, but if you look around at most of the teams that have won the Stanley Cup, a lot of times the guys that stay in those teams for, you know, eight, nine, ten years are the third, fourth line guys, the kind of underappreciated guys that do all the right things. Well, having somebody with the heart of a player like Lance Bulma, those are hard to come by, so... It, you don't want to get rid of those types too often. No, you don't. And, they're yeah, they're hard to find in the draft, and it's those intangibles that you're not going to find. And a guy whose shins and ankles are as sturdy as his to take as many shot blocks as he does, that's not something that you find very often either. Every time I watch him get in front of a puck, I just cringe. I think, oh, this, this guy's going to get hurt. Oh, I know. Well, Matt, we also saw uh, two players return to the lineup in the San- in the second San Jose game this past week. Uh, we saw the return of Curtis Glencross after his injuries, and also David Wolf coming back in the lineup. David Wolf's second NHL game, and what did you think of his second performance? Uh, it was an up and down performance. It, when he was playing well, him and Joel Colborn were having a great time cycling the puck and giving the Sharks fits, but when he was not doing so well, he took that one penalty, which was kind of questionable, and a couple of times that on their shifts, they got hemmed in their own zone. So if Wolf can be more consistent and in the cycling game in the offensive zone and better defensively, I think he'll stick in the NHL for a while. He played uh, seven and a half minutes for his total time on ice in the the San Jose game. And I agree with you. I definitely don't think the second outing was as good as his first outing. Um, his first outing was much more solid. He Maybe it's maybe he's not fully recovered from his injury. I don't know because he had that bad leg laceration. Um, but, yeah, I agree with you. He had some good moments and some bad moments against the Sharks. And I think there was enough good to – Give him another shot. Yeah. Uh, it's one of those things that Calgary lacks 
somebody that can play that physical game while managing the puck effectively and he and Colborn like that was the first time in a long time that the flames out muscled somebody yeah, in was. order to cycle the puck and i think that dynamic could be useful for the flames just to give a different look to things and with Bolig out, I mean, Wolf drew into Bolig's spot in the lineup last night. I think that with Bolig out, this might give Wolf a chance to really show if he can or can't kind of take that tough guy spot on the team. Last time he was in the lineup for his first game, he played with David Bolig in the lineup. And without that, we might see that maybe the Flames say, you know what, just as a lot of these guys have, yeah, he can earn a spot over a veteran this year. Yeah, uh, it's one of those things that you have to see, and I'm looking forward to the Kings game because of the fact that LA is one of the larger teams, and if Wolf can continue to have that good puck possession against a team like that. That that will be very interesting to see what happens. Well, after this week, uh, the Flames now sit 17-4-1 and against their Pacific Division rivals. And if you look at who's in that Pacific Division, Anaheim, Calgary, San Jose being the big three that are in the playoffs, um, there's a lot of good hockey that's being played in that division. So that's a pretty impressive record. Mm-hmm. And the fact that they have only dropped uh, two games uh, other than against Anaheim, like... That's actually incredible to me. Like it against is. the other five teams, we've only lost twice in regulation. Yeah, I mean, we got Anaheim, Calgary, San Jose, Vancouver, LA, Arizona, and Edmonton in our division. And you're right, with two of those losses coming against uh, the Ducks, that means that we've only lost twice in that division, and that's that's pretty good. Yeah, one to the Sharks, one to the Vancouver in the first game of the season. And we're looking very good against teams that historically we haven't. Like, you know, we've looked very good against the Sharks this year. We've won that series. The Flames have looked very good against Los Angeles this year. So I think that, you know, that's a sign of um, may, the strength, I guess, that this team is possessing, that they're able to play with some of those big boys. Mm-hmm. Well, anytime that you can be 3-0 and against the defending Stanley Cup champions, you're doing something right. For sure, for sure. And, you know, we could, we could talk about if LA's maybe lost their way or not, but, you know, from a Flames perspective, you're right. It's been great to watch those games because usually when we watch the Flames play whoever the defending champions are, it doesn't usually end up historically in our favor in the last couple of years. No. <laughs> so if the playoffs were today, uh, the Flames hold the second spot in the Pacific Division with 63 points. If the playoffs were today we would take on the sharks and to me that is a playoff series that i would be totally fine with because i think that we could make it past that first round yeah and especially with the sharks struggles in the playoffs and how calgary plays i think that the flames would probably be the favorite for that series yeah we've had great success against them in the regular season we know the sharks choke every uh every playoff somewhere somewhere down the road they always end up choking um, they can win one or two series, but yeah, at some point they're going to choke. And I think, I think that the Flames could take that one. Yeah, that would probably be the most favorable matchup of anybody, really. Yeah, I, I, I think you're right. I think that if they're, if I'm looking at where the playoff standings are right now, that's the team I think we'd do the best against in a seven game series. Are there any teams that are currently in the playoffs that you look at and go, I really don't think the Flames. I don't want the Flames to take them on. I don't think the Flames have any chance in a seven-game series. Uh, there's only one team that I say that there's absolutely zero chance of winning, and that's the Anaheim Ducks. I agree with you. The, the, that team is just brutal. <laughs> and we've yeah. had historically bad luck against the Ducks in the playoffs, too. Yeah, like even in 5 6 when we faced them, the Flames were the better team throughout the even the playoff round, and yet somehow Anaheim found a way to win. And knowing our knowing our curse and the fact that Anaheim would have home ice advantage, we'd lose the first two of the series. Probably, yeah. That 
that might be a four game series and not in the Flames' favor. <laughs> no. So I think the yeah. Flames could definitely beat San Jose. I don't think it would necessarily take seven games. I think in seven games we could take Winnipeg or Vancouver. Um, it might take all seven games to do it. Yeah, and the the other teams that are in the Central Division, I think the Flames would have difficulty with any of the three at the top. Yeah, I agree with you, but I think if we could get through that first round against our Pacific Division foes, um, you know, I would be... I would be okay if we ended up going out to Nashville, St. Louis, to Chicago. That seems like that would be a you know a worthy opponent to take us down. Well, we'd only face them if we were in the Stanley Cup final or one of the wild card teams. So, yeah, no, it's yeah, but I mean, if we can get that far, but yeah, I think if we if we make it to the first round, I'd be okay with San Jose. I'd be okay with Winnipeg, Vancouver, even if LA managed to sneak in there instead of Vancouver. We've had success against them. So, yeah, I agree with you. The only team I'd really be concerned about that's realistically going to be in our way is the Ducks, and hopefully we're not going to slide that far down. Yeah. Or face them in the second round. (laughs) True. And, you know, who knows? By the second round, depending on who they take on, it could be a different Ducks team. They could be beat up. They could have some injuries. We've got depth this year that most teams don't. Yeah. Who would think that in 2014-2015, we, we as Flames fans would be talking about playoff matchups in February? Not even playoff matchups, but being second overall in the division. Like, if we were going to be talking playoff matchups, we thought at the beginning of the season this team might be able to sneak into the last wild card spot. Yeah, and even that was unrealistic. Yeah, that was kind of our best case scenario. So yeah, who would have it's, thought that we'd be in a home ice advantage on February tenth? <laughs> that's pretty pretty amazing, isn't it? Yeah, kind of unbelievable. Yeah, really, it is. And if you think about this whole season, it's really been unbelievable. Like it's it's been such a ride this year. And I've been reflecting lately on what's going to happen next year. Like you know, after this year, if we don't, if we go back to I guess what we're probably expected to be, it's going to be a bit of a letdown. Yeah, and I hope fans are patient. Like, if the Flames do struggle next year, that, you know, like, people don't call for the general manager or the coach's head just because they might not be doing as well. I think as we usually see it, um, we're going to have the kind of bandwagon fans who are going to say, yeah, the Flames can't make the playoffs two years in a row. What a crappy team. Let's fire the GM. And then there will be the fans that listen to this show and the fans that are more in tune with things that do realize, you know what, it was a fluke of a year. It shouldn't have happened. We're so happy it did. But, you know, we're back to where we need to be and working hard on rebuilding and glad that we didn't hopefully sacrifice at the deadline to send us further back in that rebuild. Mm-hmm. Fun times ahead. So after the win against the San Jose Sharks on Monday uh, that put the Flames at 30 total wins for this season... And comparing that to last year, we had only 35 total wins. And you did some research for us into uh, how long it's taken us to get to 30 wins the last couple of years. Last year, we got our 30th win also against the Sharks, but it wasn't until March 24th. Um, in 2013, our lockout shortened season, we didn't get 30 wins, which not surprising there. We lost half a season. Uh, 2012, we got our 30th win on March 6th. 2011, we got the 30th win on February 16th versus Dallas. And 2010, we got a February 10th versus the Ducks. So if we look at all these seasons where we haven't made the playoffs, even though it is February now, we're you know at least a couple weeks, uh, uh, almost a month ahead of where we usually are when we get 30 wins. Yeah, and even in uh, the 2010 through 2012 seasons, we didn't miss the playoffs by that much. So, the fact that the Flames are ahead of schedule on even those seasons, perhaps that means that we will actually finally break through and make the playoffs. And if you look back to, I think it was 2010, 2011, and 2012, where they had the heavily weighted schedules all those years in favor of our division. 
And at that time, we had some, you know, like Vancouver was a very good team for a number of those years. So I think we played them, what, like eight times, each team in our division in those years? Yes. So, you know, the schedule's been changed since then. So I would be curious to see, obviously, we can't go back and remodel it against the current schedule. But I'd be curious to see how the Flames would do in those years if they hadn't have had so many games against top flight teams. True. And you also have to remember, in those three seasons, the Flames really struggled down the stretch. And they did. It seemed like every time there was an important game, they'd get blown out. Well, and, and not only that, but I mean, that's an interesting point too. You're right, they would get blown out. But talking about down the stretch, traditionally, every year I can think of in the last, I don't know, five seasons, the Flames always run into injury problems late. True. And I think it was, what was it, 2012 or 2011, where it looked like we had a shot at making maybe the eighth spot. Maybe it's even 2010. I'd have to go back and look. But it looked like we had a chance of making the eighth spot, and our roster just got decimated. I think at one point we had like five guys injured in a week. Mm hmm. And sometimes, you know, injuries can be an excuse, and especially with uh, Calgary's lack of depth in previous seasons. That yeah, you know, you're you are replacing players with guys like Chris Kalanos, which you know, give me a break. <laughs> yeah, and that's where I think this year there's really you know even if we do get a rash of injuries, there's no excuse for that because I think we are one of if not the deepest team in the league this year, and we've had guys that can prove yeah they can step in and play, you know, for the twenty fifteen ten however many games there might be left if we do run into injury problems. Yeah, and especially like you look at guys like Poirier, Grandland, Berchi. Like I can go on for like yeah. five, ten minutes on like all, all the names. You know, you even got Sam Bennett. So like, if worse came to worse, you'd be just replacing it with the injured player with the quality replacement. So yeah, no so I think deal. that's that's a bit of an insurance policy that we perhaps haven't had. You know, the last handful of years. Talking about the makeup of the team and guys on the team and some of that depth, there was an interesting thread that you and I were looking at uh, today on Calgary Puck from a user named TVP2003, and it really talked about the makeup of this team and where the Flames' assets have come from. And I thought it was kind of interesting. Um, if we look at that, every GM that you hear in the league who's rebuilding talks about how they have to rebuild through the draft, rebuild through the draft, and... As much as I think there is a valid point to that, I think that if you look at the Flames roster right now, it's interesting because the players that are playing here, not, not a good portion of them have not been drafted by the Flames. And the ones that have, most of them are later round picks. Yeah, like it, for the guys that were drafted by Calgary, you had Sean Monahan and Michael Backlund as the only first round picks on the roster. Uh, Marcus Granlund, who was a second round pick, Lance Boma was a third rounder, and both Brody and Gaudreau were fourth round picks. And, you know, if you look at, you know, the Flames' tendency to throw away second round picks when Daryl Sutter was here, who knows what else we could have got there. But the fact that, you know, we've only got two first round guys and most, you know, perhaps two of our best players this year have been fourth round players. It shows that the Flames have done better scouting lately and that you really need to really look at, do we want to throw away some of those depth picks sometimes? True. But even in uh, trades that they made using uh, fourth and fifth round picks, they have gotten some useful players like Chris Russell, Joe Colborn, Brandon Bolig, even to a lesser extent uh, Dennis Weidman. Because I think we traded a fifth round pick to acquire his rights. Yeah, so, I th yeah, and that was pretty much done. I, th if I remember right, before like it, June twenty eighth or something. Yeah, it was like right after the draft. But you know, looking at that, you're right. The guys they drafted has been a large chunk of the guys that have done really well for us this year. But we also have you know two undrafted free agents, which was Giordano and Joris, who were both uh, picked up as UFAs, undrafted. And then we've got a whole smattering of players who we've signed as UFAs, and it really shows you that the Flames have built around these players well with the UFA market. They brought in Hiller, 
I would probably put Weidman in there as a UFA signing. Uh, Glenn Cross, Raymond, Hoodler, and, you know, arguably England and Diaz are in there. Their actual progress this year is questionable. But, you know, they have they have done a good job of bringing in UFAs in a supporting role and not not necessarily trading away a lot of assets for those. Uh, yeah, the guys that we've... Oh, sorry, go ahead. Uh, uh, well, the thing is, is that we haven't really spent money on one of the top guys in free agency. It's always been yeah. just the depth guys. Like, even Hoodler at the time was a second, third round, or third line guy. And, and like, he has emerged as a first liner for Calgary, but it's more filling out the depth part of the roster. Same thing with Glenn Cross. When we brought him in, he was really like a third liner, and he's had the chance to emerge here. Mm Mm-hmm. And to me, that's one of the things that even if I look back all the way through, you know, let's go back as far as 2004, um, to me, that's one thing the Flames have done well since then is that they've been able to bring in these second, third-tier UFAs and really give them a chance to shine. You know, they might not have all done really well, but I look at guys like Krishna Selyus, um, you know, Ole Jokinen in his second round, in his second go-around here. Um, you know, some of these guys, Mika Kiprasov, great example, guys that are not in a, a top role on another team but come here and seem to do very well. Yeah, and sometimes players just need an opportunity to show what they got. And the guy that's emblematic of that for the Flames right now is Chris Russell, who was buried on both Columbus and St. Louis's depth charts and was never given the opportunity to take a larger role and until he got to Calgary. Yeah, and and that's, you know, the guys I mentioned, we could go back and look at a lot of guys, but you're right, it's all the same idea. It's these guys that... Yeah, they're buried somewhere else. They come here, they get a bigger role. They might not always be the best player for the Flames, but there's a lot of guys that we've seen where we start to see this kind of stroke of an upward swing while they've been here. And so they've done very good with that kind of UFA shopping, a buy low, sell high. True. Um, you know, even even some of the older guys that have come in or guys like, you know, I think Marcus Nielsen was that way. Um he really improved while he was here. Um, you know, we've had we've had all sorts of players that have come in, yeah, and we bought them as unknowns and really made them better than they were. There's been players that have gone the other way too. But yeah, good for good for the Flames for being able to find those deals and not go out and break the bank trying to get always the top star. Well, realistically, a team needs to like as they're developing towards being a contending team, they need to find players from everywhere, and because you you don't have enough draft picks unless you're like L.A. Uh, from two thousand five through I think two thousand eight, where like every draft they'd have like fourteen or fifteen draft picks. Or what but, was the one draft that the Avalanche had like five first round picks? Yeah, something like that. I think that was the year that they got Tange and uh, Regeer, if I recall correctly. I think yeah, it was I think you might be right. But you know, it, drafts like that don't you you can't just solve the problems with one draft. You need to find guys like Joris, like Wolf, like Giordano that are external from that, and hopefully continue to find those depth players either using like a sixth or seventh round pick and getting somebody or like how they have with Gaudreau and Brody because usually when you're in the midst of a rebuild it's only for like two or three years really where you're getting prime picks and then your team's naturally gonna improve a bit so unless you're Edmonton but and I think some of this might show us too that um the Flames perhaps realized that they had a weakness in drafting for a while and so had to fill you know, that weakness by doing something else, which it, it looks like is UFA shopping. The one thing that I think helped turn it out around was uh, the hiring of Michel Goulet. Uh, he was with Colorado before, and uh, since he's been here, the Flames drafting has significantly improved. So I don't know if it's him specifically, but he did do a very good job with Colorado 
when he was I think it's there. him. I think we could probably credit John Weisbrod for some of that too. He seemed to have brought the Flames kind of in a new focus at looking at uh, college players. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, there's a lot of people that have been influential in that. If you look at the Flames roster continuing this uh, breakdown and the players that we've traded for, and really I had to go back and rank my mind to figure out where we got some of these guys, but the only players in the roster that were acquired through trade are Laddie Smead, Matt Stajan, David Jones, Paul Byron, and Kerry Ramo. And really, if you look at those players and what we gave up for each of them, I think that if we break them down player by player, the only one that you might say, well, maybe the only two deals there you might say were not in the Flames' favor were probably the Byron deal and the Stajan deal, and even those are arguable. Well, I'd also kind of say the Jones deal, but that was more just to get rid of the presence of Alex Tangay on the roster yeah, more than anything. I think anyway. that was four guys being moved that just needed a change of scenery. Mm-hmm. I think it was time for, for Sarich to go at the same time. But, I mean, you know, the Lottie Smee deal, we gave up what? We gave up... Uh, Laurent Brassois and Laurent, Roman Horak. Right, and Horak, and we got back uh, Smeed and Olivier Waugh, who's no longer in the organization. And yeah. Horak's, Horak was looking good at the time, but he hasn't looked too hot since. Yeah, he's gone to the KHL, and yeah. So who knows if he'll ever be back in an Oilers jersey or at any, any NHL point. jersey. Uh, Stajan came over in the now infamous uh, Dion Phaneuf deal. He's the Which only I still piece. think is a good trade in so much to get rid of Dion Phaneuf. Because <laughs> I, I don't think, think in... uh, I don't think Giordano might have uh, emerged as well as he has if Phaneuf was still here. Yeah, I think in hindsight it's become a good deal. But at the time when you looked at it, it was not a good oh, deal for the Flames. Yeah. From a pure like hockey talent perspective that was a bad trade but yeah i think in the long run it's actually turned out to be a pretty good one and especially with the replacement of dennis weidman for that kind of offensive defenseman yeah i think and all you know all i really it think that bad. if it wasn't that trade we would have seen Fenoff go eventually anyways i think when kind of the old guard left and we saw you know jerome go and we saw Kipper retire, and we saw Bomeister go. I think if he was still around, we probably would have seen Fanuf go at that point as well. Yeah, more than likely. Uh, David Jones, we talked about. Paul Byron came in the Robin Regeer deal. That was, at the time, again, a deal that didn't look great. That's where we were trying to get rid of Alish Code Leak, and uh, it cost us to get rid of Alish Code Leak. But yeah. in. In the end, it looks like it's turned out okay for the Flames. Yeah. It, yes and no. It's one of those deals that I think uh, the GM was thinking that Chris Butler was going to be better than he ended up being. Yeah. So, yeah, if I think I... he was basically hoping that he would be the defenseman that Chris Russell has turned into. Yeah, no, you're right. If I that was a deal that was done uh, on draft day in 2011, and it was Byron and Butler to the Flames in exchange for Regeer, Code Leak, and I believe a second a round second. pick. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, no, I agree with you. I think that to me, Chris Butler was the piece that the Flames really wanted there, and it's funny that it's turned out that Byron's a piece that we've kept. Yeah. And Byron's played well this year. Like uh, it's not slagging on Byron's play. It's just that was a kind of a bad deal. I think it was a bad deal, but I think it's become less of a bad deal if we look at where some of those pieces have gone. Yeah. Well, you also have to look at Regeer was kind of terrible for the Sabres and has redeemed himself since being reunited with Sutter. So yeah. Yeah, it's one of those that was kind of a loss for both sides. Yeah, it was. And, uh, of course, Ramo, we all know the Ramo deal, came over in the, what was that, the Mike Camilleri deal. Yeah, yeah. Camilleri and, uh, for Bork, a second-round pick, and I think it was Holland. I think you're right. 
And at the time, Rama was playing in uh, in Russia. He was an older goalie that a lot of people didn't really think was probably worth much. And again, has really been given a chance to shine in North America. And I think shown that he can, you know, stay here in North America and play as an NHL goaltender. Yeah, and whether or not he remains in the NHL past this season is somewhat in doubt, just because a lot of teams already have backup goalies, so I don't know if he might even be able to find a contract after this year. Yeah, I don't know. I think there's a GM or two that would want to bring him in as a good kind of 1B or insurance guy. Yeah. It all depends on dollars, really. If he can get a starting job in Russia and get paid 3 or $4 million versus, you know, being a million-dollar backup somewhere, you know, it, it depends yeah. on what his perspective is. Yeah, that's true. So, you know, looking at that breakdown of the team, I'd say that it shows that you can't build a team and rely, as we said, just around drafting players and putting them on the roster. And even though, you know, guys like Stajan and Smead and, you know, Russell and Colborn aren't big name players, the Flames have done the right thing to, as you mentioned, go out and find the discount players who have some potential and give those guys a chance to show off that potential. We see other franchises where, you know, I'll see a player who has so much potential and you just look at them and they're put in the wrong role or they're not given enough ice time. And you just think, you know, if only this guy was able to stretch his wings. And that's really a chance that over the past couple of years, especially this year, the Flames have afforded a lot of these guys. Yeah, and that's one of the things that a rebuilding team needs to do is find those cheap players that aren't being given an opportunity on another club and let them like give them a shot and see what they got and if they can rise to the occasion that's great if not next basically and yeah well and we saw that this year even with Setaguchi right we gave him a chance he's shown some potential in the past maybe needed new scenery didn't work out moved moved on and haven't looked back since exactly and like a team like Edmonton per se could if they were smart, they would try and find those guys like the Colborns and the Russells from other teams and throw some late round draft picks at them and see what they can do. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with you there. So interesting just to look at how this team is made up and uh and you know where this where this team has come from. And we'll post a link to this thread that we we're looking at on uh, Facebook and Twitter. So if you want to read it yourself. You can go check it out. We are talking a little bit about Kerry Ramo as well, and uh, Matt, you were mentioning before the show that New York uh, just lost their goaltender, Henrik Lundqvist. Do you think maybe the uh, the Rangers have been calling the Flames, going, hey, you got two goalies, maybe we want to pick one of them up from you? Well, I would expect that looking around the league, the Flames are pretty much one of the few teams that has a high-end backup that might be available. It, the Rangers are kind of in a dogfight themselves. They do have a bit of a cushion on ninth place, but it it is a big issue for them if uh, Cam Talbot actually does struggle being the starter you know, they could easily find themselves on the outside looking in. And wouldn't that be weird if both L.A. and the Rangers missed the playoffs after being in the Stanley Cup Finals last year? But Not just those two miss, but then you get teams like the Flames who make it. Yeah. It'd be at the NHL Twilight Zone. Yeah. Well, seeing Nashville at the top of the standings is already a bit weird. <laughs> yeah, it's true. You know, I don't think if I'm the Rangers, and maybe if I was first in the East or second in the East, I might feel different, but where they are in the Eastern Conference and battling for, you know, their life in the playoffs, I don't know that Cam Talbot, if, if you know, Lundqvist was out for a week, maybe not, you know, I'd be okay with Talbot, but for a month, I, I think that uh, Cam Talbot is not the guy that I would rely on there. 
Yeah, and, like, he has played well. Like, it's not to say that he's been bad, but, you know, you do need an insurance guy, and they don't have anybody... Like, he, the guy they called up, he's not very good, so... Mackenzie kinda, Skapsky? Yeah, he's not very good, so they're kind of stuck right at the moment. So, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if they would be looking... Yeah, like, a team like Nashville, when Pekka Rene went down... They were already well off in the standings, and like they could hold the fort by relying on their backup and their AHL goalie. Because even if they lost most of those games, they would still be in the playoffs. But the Rangers, they're right on the bubble as it is right now, and I don't think that they could risk having the two inexperienced guys for the month. No, and even if you look at the goalies in their system, uh, the most experienced of whom is Cedric Desjardins, he's not a guy that I would look at and go, well, this guy's good enough either. So looking through their system, they have a hole there. And really with you know the next month meaning so much to everyone's playoff chances, I wouldn't be surprised if they're kicking the tires on Ramo. Yeah. And realistically, there's not too many guys that are out there at this point that you can say, oh, this is a quality backup that's expendable. Usually most teams are lucky if they have one guy that's even halfway decent. Well, not just expendable, but it's nice maybe for the Rangers because he is a UFA at the end of the year. So if they decide, you know what, he came in, he backed up Lundqvist, he did his job, we don't want to bring him back, it's not like they're going to be stuck with this guy for multiple years. Yeah, exactly. And... Plus, with having Talbot there, maybe you look at the two guys and have like a mini battle to see who's re-signable for next year, because I think Talbot's a UFA as well. Uh, they just re-signed him. Okay, in, my mistake. Actually, in, in uh, December they re-signed him. Okay, my mistake. So, yeah, no, that's cool. Um, you know, I know I don't follow them. I'm just on the Rangers website and see that there, so... Um, but yeah, no, I, I think it would definitely be, if I was the Rangers GM, I'd definitely be calling the flames. What would you want back? And do you think that the, the cost goes up because they have an obvious need right now? Honestly, I would either want like a, basically a third round pick or maybe one of their defensive prospects. I'm not exactly up on, uh, their here, just give me a sec. I'm going to go to Hockey's sure. Future to see their... They don't have anyone that really stands out as a top uh, player within their organization that we'd be able to get. Um, you know, they've like everyone, you've got your kind of, you know, top line, top flight players. Um, but, you know, nobody that if you look in their system at who's there, you would really be able to say, yeah, this is a guy we might want. Um, I don't know. I'm yeah, their at... defensive prospects all kind of are mediocre. Yeah, they are. So like I've uh, seen the... Ryan, I've seen Ryan Graves play. He's not bad, but I don't know that they would want to give him up. Yeah, That's like Brady Sky is not too bad, but again, they he's probably too good for a player like Ramo. So yeah, uh, and if you look at their the NHL flames... defensemen, they're yeah, too like old. A... Like. Yeah, like unless the Flames were to include another player with Ramo for a guy like Brady Sky, I, yeah, like I don't see there being a good fit in terms of prospects. So you'd no. most likely just take a draft pick. And even if I look at the NHL defenseman they've got there, Dan Boyle, I don't want to touch him. He's 38. Uh, Dan Giardi, they're not going to give up. Matt Hunwick is 29. Kevin Klein I like, but he's 30, and that's not the kind of guy I'd want to bring in. Uh, you know, John Moore, um, probably not. Maybe John Moore if we gave up more. And obviously they're not going to part with Mark Stahl. No. And even, like, their right-wingers, they don't... Like, Christo's kind of turning into a bust, and Jesper Fass is not very good either. So, like, it... Yeah, I'd probably just end up taking a draft pick. Yeah, it, I. It, and if if I I agree with you that the going rate for a guy like Ramo would probably be a third. Do you think if you're Tre Living, 
you bump it up to a second because you don't need to make the move and these guys are in need? Uh, no, nah, I'd probably just take the third and run with it. Like, you'd always try to get more. Like, a, you know, maybe a third and a fifth or something, but I don't think yeah. the Rangers are that desperate to trade both. And, you know, looking at the wingers that the uh, Rangers have in their organization, a guy like Lundqvist might not be bad as a fit there. True. In which case, then you might be able to pick off a higher-end talent. So, yeah, yeah like, uh, there are options. Like, it's one of those things that you might be able to check off several boxes for them and... Yeah, it's just kind of interesting to note because we've n- mentioned in the past that I think the only way the Flames would do a deal early is if there's a goalie that got hurt and someone needed a goalie. And with, you know, uh, Lundqvist out, I could see the Rangers and the Flames getting some done over the next couple of days here. Yeah, we can I see I wouldn't that. be surprised if by this time next week uh, Ramo's not a Flame and he's instead a blue shirt, but I also wouldn't be surprised if he is. Yeah, it's one of those things that between now and when the trade deadline is in the early beginning of March, uh, any trade could happen. And we could see guys like Glenn Cross, Ramo, David Jones, a whole host of guys possibly being moved. So it's And you really know, with less than a month until the deadline, I'm surprised we haven't heard a lot more rumors yet. Like we've got really... Th- three weeks until the trade deadline. And usually this is when rumors start coming out. And the only thing I've heard is uh, that if the Flames wanted to pick up Evander Kane from the Jets, it's going to cost them Sam Bennett. And, of course, that's not a deal they're going to make. Yeah, of course. And, like, why would you trade for a guy that's hurt anyway? So, like, it's not like it's something that's going to improve your playoff chances a trade for Evander Kane would only happen at the draft and at that rate you you wouldn't want to trade Bennett anyway especially if he comes in and plays for Calgary in the next couple of weeks yeah so I I don't know it seems eerily quiet to me this close to the deadline maybe it's because the Flames don't plan to do much um but yeah just it seems Seems well, like even across quiet. the league, there hasn't been many That's true. trade rumors either. And That's true. Like if you look at the playoffs, there's only a handful of teams in the West that are out. Like it's pretty much just Arizona and Edmonton that are out, and in the East, it's only Toronto, Columbus, Carolina, and Buffalo that are like for sure out, and everybody else is kind of close enough where they could make a run. Yeah, no, that's true. I feel really sorry at this point with the lack of news for the guys on TSN. Their trade breaker guys are going to be sitting there all day with probably nothing to talk about. Yeah. Well, it's one of those things that in Calgary's case, uh, that might be a good idea to sell anyway, even if we are in a playoffs spot, just because of the fact that there's not going to be a lot of sellers, A, and B, we have the depth to be able to replace those guys with cap quality talent yeah I, I don't know if I'd call them sellers I think there's definitely guys we have to move but when I think of sellers on the deadline I think of guys who pretty much say everybody's for sale and I don't know the flames would be in that position I think we have three or four guys we need we could strategically look at moving but if the deal's not there I wouldn't just do the deal just to you know bring in some extra draft picks or something like that yeah it, like everything it depends on what the offers are as well yep for sure well, with, uh, with wrapping up kind of the Flames news for the week, why don't we chat a little bit about Adirondack? And unlike the Flames who had a good week, the Baby Flames had a poor week this week. I don't know what it is about Utica and Adirondack, but they just can't seem to buy a win against the Utica Comets. I think they've lost every game this year. And, like... I know in like three or four of the games, the Flames have significantly outplayed them and yet still come away with the loss. And I think in the last game, they outshot them something like 40 to 20. I don't know, can't remember the exact shot tolls, but it was that kind of difference and yet they lost handily. Jakob Markstrom has their number. 
And for those that don't know, the Utica Comets are the AHL affiliate of our friends to the to the west, uh, the Vancouver Canucks. So well, yeah, I, I think, say that they are friends, but yeah, <laughs> okay, our rivals to the west, the Vancouver Canucks. Um, I agree. I think that the big thing there is Markstrom. They've played good games, but Markstrom keeps stoning them. Yeah. And I, I really, I mean, even if you look at other Utica games, I've watched a couple games of Utica versus other teams through the AHL live stuff, and Markstrom's the guy that picks up the wins for them. He's like their kipper soft. Yeah. Uh, they were playing tonight, oddly enough, against Syracuse, and Adirondack crunched them 10 nothing. Wow. wow. <laughs> That's crazy. It was only 4 nothing going into the third period, but yeah, they scored six in the wow, third. That's, oh, that's crazy. Good for those fans there. That's a great game to watch. And uh, just as a note as well, since we're talking about the Baby Flames, um, they made moves yesterday. The Adirondack Flames announced that they've recalled Brett Kulak from the Colorado Eagles, which is good to see. I always like to see prospects get more AHL time. And assigned goalie Doug Carr to Colorado. So... Not too worried about Doug Carr, not really a guy that, you know, is probably going to make it at the NHL level, but good to see Kulak getting some more AHL time. Yeah, and Ryan Culkin is out pretty much for the remainder of the season. He uh, got uh, stepped on his wrist. And, yeah, I saw uh, that. Yeah, he's had surgery to repair the tendons in his wrist, and he'll be out for 8 to 10 weeks. So. And as you've noticed in the past, Kulak and uh, and Kalkin are a lot a lot of similarities in their game. I wouldn't say they're the same player, but a lot of similarities in their game. So it makes sense that one replaces the other. Yeah. And they bring most of the same style of play as well. They're and almost Sedin-ish in their similarities. Yeah, that's true. Though they don't have the same last name, but we could, we could maybe combine their last name somehow and come up with something. Yeah. Berchi had a hat trick in the game, and uh, yeah, ten goals. I'd expect a couple guys probably had a hat trick. Turner Elson had a pair. Nice. And surprisingly, Emil Poirier only had one assist. He can't be hot every night. True. And uh, while we're on an AHL note, the Flames are petitioning fans for a name for the new team next year in Stockton. And if you go to the Stockton Thunder website, you can submit your idea for a name. Matt, do you have any ideas for the name for next year? Anything you'd want to put out there? Yeah, I think that they would be best just to go with something that's California-based instead of going with the Flames. My suggestion was the Stockton Convicts because it seems like the Flames AHL team is always on the run. Yeah, no... I don't think that'd get too much good press. <laughs> or the Stockton stopgap, because knowing the Flames will be out of there in 18 months. <laughs> well, they could always go with the Stockton Scorch and, you know, bring the infamous Adirondack logo and colors with them. I, I really wonder, now that the Adirondack team is not going to be there, what's going to happen to Scorch? We should call them up and see if we can buy them. Maybe do a Kickstarter. Yeah. Fireside Chat needs a new mascot. Well, they could always uh, make that the logo for Stockton, is the Dancing Scorch. <laughs> Some sort of find a way to make an animated gif on the front of the jersey, so it's just dancing as they play. Yeah. <laughs> Little screen, like an iPad or something on the, lo on the actual jersey. <laughs> You never know, but I, I don't think it'll be the Scorch. Hopefully they don't pick either of my names because they're horrible names. Um, I wouldn't mind if they stayed with the Thunder. Yeah. Well, I, I know that Adirondack will be announcing what the ECHL team's name's going to be for next year. So that'll be tomorrow. Okay. We'll see. And I know the Flames have trademarked the Stockton Grizzlies, so maybe they're going to go that way, but if if they're asking for fan feedback, I don't think you can say, well, those all sucked. So away we go with the Grizzlies. Yeah. And I don't we'll know see. enough about Stockton as a city and its history to know if there's anything like, you know, the Flames. I mean, Atlanta, the Flames were very historic there. Um, maybe there's something historical about that city that we don't know that'll make a cool name. Yeah. Well, anything else you want to chat about? 
No, I'm good. I'm hoping that the Flames have a good week this upcoming week, and we'll see how they do. We got uh, two games. Well, th- actually, three games on the on the schedule for this coming week. We've got uh, tomorrow night, or I guess Thursday night. Actually, the Flames take on the LA Kings. Saturday, we've got the Vancouver Canucks, and Monday, the Boston Bruins come to town. Matt, six points on the table, three big games. How do you think we're going to do? I'm going to go with four points. And Wins which over game the do you Kings think and win? the Bruins. You think we're going to beat the Bruins? Yeah. They they haven't been very good this year, and they, they've been without Chara, if I recall, for a long portion of the season, so I think we can beat them. I'm looking at the... I'm looking at the schedule, and yeah, I'll go the same as you. I'm going to go uh, four points. I think we'll beat the Kings, and yeah, you're right. I think we'll probably beat the Bruins. And looking at the stats so far, we've been predicting these every week, but we've actually been keeping track since January. And as of right now, um, Matt, I'm up on you by one week. It's two to one. So hopefully this week we can tie and you can get another point. But Well, you I'm can't because a- you copied my... Standing, well, that's right. So. You you can get another point, but I'll still be up on you. So you, you can you can hopefully get another point, but hopefully I won't be up on you. Um, actually, ho- yeah. Either way, we're we're going to be in the same position. So four points. We'll see how things go. Well, here I'll switch mine. I'll say that we'll beat all three teams, and there you go. <laughs> You're going to be brave. Yeah. All right. So it's either you get a point or I get a point. This could either put me up by two, or it could tie us up. Yeah. So come right. on, come on, Flames, beat, a, see how, beat everybody. See <laughs> That's right. Just sweep the week for Matt. All right, my friend. Well, we will talk to you next week, and hopefully, we'll have six points. I'm hoping you're right. Yeah. Take it easy, everybody. Have an awesome week, and go Flames, go. Fireside Chat is edited by Mike Crosby and Brett Bauer. This show is licensed under Creative Commons license. For full license information, visit firesidechat.ca.